from the Midwest, Canada, Seattle, all those nice cold places. Tonight I'm going to warm you up. Tonight I'm going to, I think, make you proud to be an American. Because we're going to talk about the greatest tyranny that existed in the 20th century and the suffering that millions and millions of Europeans across Europe, occupied German Jew, endured. This is a story about inside Hitler's Europe, the 12 years of the Third Reich and the six years of Hitler's Europe. Here is Europe, a map, in 1939. You see the stain in the middle, the Axis countries, Germany, Italy, united the Romberlin Axis, the Pact of Steve. The man who would orchestrate this tremendous destruction, Adolf Hitler, probably one of the greatest evil political geniuses in history. When you consider he took a group of 15 men in the back of a beer hall, took over Germany, and almost conquered Europe and its democracies permanently, and could have changed the course of US history for much, much longer had the situation not turned out as it did. Of course, I've talked about many issues in World War II. Many of you have heard those programs previously. Tonight, this is not a military program as much as it is a program about life in Europe. The German army, probably the greatest overall army in the 20th century. As Winston Churchill said, the German army never made little mistakes. Only big ones. <laughs> but this was the army that conquered Europe. From the shores of the Atlantic to almost Moscow. From Spitsbergen in the north to the Mediterranean and almost the Nile River in Egypt. This is not a story about Nazi Europe. This is a story about Hitlerian Europe and the occupation of these countries. Some endured more, as France did in Norway, for many more years than others. But the war and occupation became the Nazi way of integrating the continent. It consumed about a quarter of all the resources of the continent of Europe in order to keep the German war effort going. This was entirely the consequence of the need to mobilize resources and the Germans basically had no vision beyond the exploitation of Europe. Those who endured the German occupation were often hailed as historic resistors, and many were. But they, we have passed in silence over the fact that for German officials that most have occupied Europe, they were not overly troubled by resistance until the very end of the war that the Germans had managed to divert the resources of the continent to the benefit of their own war economy has been attributed to coercion. But we must understand that for many Europeans coming out of the Depression, their country, their companies, and the fact of high unemployment, many initially were very happy to cooperate with the German war machine. It meant contracts and meant work for many Europeans. So many of the thousands unemployed French and Dutch, Croatian, Spanish, and Italians at first willingly worked as guest workers in German factories. Only later in 43 and 44 did they become slave labor, and many of them starved to death. This was Hitler's personal standard. He imposed his own ideas on the European order, not Germany. I want to make that very clear. There are Germans here in this audience. This is a great stain on the history of man. This is a stain brought about by Adolf Hitler and his willing henchmen, and uh, obviously by those who collaborated with him across Europe. But it is not something that I do not think the people of Europe and the Germans have denied. Hitler had no master plan to administer Europe. He had no economic plan. The Nazis were divided up into fiefdoms. It was an empire under Hitler's thumb. He kept it that way so that he had to make all the big decisions. I live in Cook County, Illinois. 
the helm of the last big political machine. Now Mayor Daley, the last one, is retiring. I always tell people it would be as if the Cook County Democratic machine ran the United States with all the fiefdoms, all of the political chicanery. That was the Nazi party. And to some degree, that was the Soviet Union and today modern China. Do not think the premier of China is in control of China. He isn't. The Communist Party is with all of its little fiefdoms. The results, though, for Hitler and for Europe was inefficiency and chaos. This is the great myth of Germany. The, Germans, the German army may have been very efficient in many ways, but Hitler's regime was highly inefficient and we will see almost came to a grinding halt several times. It had no diplomatic framework to run a united German Europe. That was a myth. Hitler was a haphazard and lazy manager at best. He made decisions on impulse. He paid, had poor attention span to operational long-term details. As the war went on, he became increasingly isolated. And he lived basically in only several places. One here is the chancellery he built in Berlin. Second was Berchtesgarten. There he is with Blondie, his dog, and Eva Brown, his mistress. It's a toss-up on who he loved more. <laughs> and here is the eagle's nest. The eagle's nest, by the way, is still there. They tried to bomb it in the war. The bombs missed. You can still get there and see it. There's a tremendous view. This is the tea house he used. It was above where the compound was, where the, the Nazi leaders had there. But he spent a lot of time there. And then the, the final place, oops, we're skipping ahead here, was here in East Prussia. It was the Wolfenstein the Wolf's Lair, his military headquarters, a bunker-like maximum security military establishment. He shuttled between these three sites during most of the war, and operationally, this is how he ran Europe. He did not visit bomb-out cities. He rarely went anywhere else, as we're going to see. So to better understand Europe, we're going to take a look now at the major parts, collaboration, resistance, theft, and finally the aftermath, with all this brought at the end and for today. First, collaboration. Let us try to do each other the least harm possible. After all, we have to live in this Europe, whose news masters, as you know, are rather tough. This is what the French ambassador said to the Italian foreign minister in 1940, after France had surrendered. The Germans imposed their rule very suddenly across all of Europe in the midst of war and conflict. What was striking was not that the Europeans resisted, but that they mostly hesitated to resist. Pacifism was widespread across much of Europe. One reason was there was great disorientation. The coming of the Hitlerian New Order shook the legitimacy of European democracies to their roots more deeply than ever before or ever since. And for those of you here that lived through it, maybe as children, you recall your parents talking about that maybe after the war. The Germans marched into Paris in June 1940 after only a five-week war. The French people lay battered and stunned, scarred by chaos, criminality, and the astonishing swift disintegration. Millions had fled, millions of French soldiers, their husbands, brothers, lovers, were in German prisoner of war camps. The French people embraced the reassuring figure, the great hero of World War I, the, of the Battle of Verdun. His name was Marshal Philippe Pétain. He organized a new government. For he believed, as many other Frenchmen, that another war like that of 1914 to 1918 would cost France too dearly, and this view he held to the bitter end. That's why France needed to surrender. France signed an armistice with Germany in 1940, not a peace treaty. This divided the country into two zones, the occupied zone here and the unoccupied zone in the south with Vichy as its capital. 
Few people believed that the war would last much longer. Hitler had conquered all of Europe. Only Britain was left alone. Its army had lost all of its equipment. It had a tiny army. It had a navy, but it did not even have a very large air force. People thought that Churchill and the British would come to terms with Hitler, and then they would sign a peace treaty, the Germans would withdraw. Much as what happened in 1870-71 with the Franco-Prussian War. Some of you that recall your history. The same thing would happen again. So the French did not expect this to be a long occupation. Therefore, when Marshal Pétain openly began collaborating, he saw this as a way to preserve France's standing as a major power. Quote, a collaboration has been envisioned between our two countries, he said. I have accepted this in principle. That's what he said to Hitler at this meeting in October of 1940. And he announced that his government would work with Berlin, because again, he didn't think the war was going to go on much longer. Now, had France not been so badly divided before the war, remember, the French were bitterly divided between the democratic government is a communist government, a socialist party, and a, the, the old monarchist militarists. There was widespread pacifism throughout France. France had lost two million men in World War I, and the French had built a Maginot Line defense line because they did not want to fight a defensive war. Well, that failed to protect them. So, it seriously undermined the morale of the French people and the army even before a shot was fired. Also, there was widespread anti-Semitism left in France. This capitalized it. And there were some on the far right who wanted to even throw the principles of the French Revolution. They thought this was a good chance. In 1940, Hitler visited Paris for the first time. He planned a, a meticulous itinerary, particularly built around architecture. And uh, here he is. He started early in the morning in the pale gloom of the Eiffel Tower. He went to the Invalides, stared down at Napoleon's tomb. Right near is buried the King of Rome, Napoleon's son, who was the daughter also of Mary Louisa, who was the Emperor of Austria's daughter. And the, the little boy was ultimately buried in Vienna. As a sop to the French, he had the body exhumed from Vienna, brought to the Invalides, and buried with Napoleon to show this great friendship that Germany would now have for France. It didn't impress a lot of French people, I'll tell you. But he did this. You can see these tombs. That's why it's there. He was there with Albert Speer. We'll go back a slide. There, there's Speer, his architect. And he said to Speer that uh, he wanted to rebuild Berlin and make it bigger and more splendid than Paris. And for that reason, he wouldn't destroy it. The other reason was he wanted time to loot all the treasures that were in Paris, as we're going to see. Hitler believed that the French interests could be encouraged, especially German rule could be more tolerant than in other countries. The war was chiefly being fought on the Eastern Front. 75% of all the casualties of the German army were on the Eastern Front. The Germans kept very few military resources in France until the time of the Normandy invasion, where they built up a Western army, 60 divisions. The French were not willing collaborators. They were not a nation of traitors. Though they were initially drawn in large numbers to the idea of collaboration, Patin's government was popular because it appeared to promise order after the chaos of defeat. The Germans might have conquered France, but the French state survived more or less intact. Why? Well, there's Vichy France, the South. What you, we find out is that really the French civil servants continued to run the French government throughout the country, not the Germans. And in fact, the Germans were only concentrated in certain key larger areas. Therefore, most French people had very little contact with the German army. In 1940, in fact, uh, the American ambassador to the United States, we recognized the Vichy French government. The Vichy broke off 
relations with Britain after the British destroyed the French fleet in the Mediterranean, as some of you will remember, because they were afraid it was going to fall into the hands of the Germans, which it almost did. After the invasion of the USSR in June of 1941, the Germans began to have attacks on their military personnel. And it's very simple. You shoot one German, we shoot 500 Frenchmen. And we go on the street and just round up 500 people at random and shoot them. You shoot another German, we shoot 1,000 Frenchmen. And on, it will just multiply upward. This type of terrorism against the civilian population, as you could well understand, has a way of dampening fervor for an act of resistance. And this is how the Germans crushed a resistance movement throughout Western Europe. Belgium, France, in contrast to Holland, got a traditional military government. The Wehrmacht was in charge. In Poland, the map was rearranged to the Fuhrer's liking. Other parts of Europe, such as Alsace-Lorraine, became part of Germany, and uh, so did Belgium. I'm sorry, uh, so did Luxembourg. But now, the call for a unified Europe. Collaboration was itself by no means intolerable at the beginning of the war. Because remember, many people felt that democracy and liberalism had failed across large parts of Europe. Some Europeans hoped that they could unite the continent better than the League of Nations. Others were merely resigned to collaborate for the time being. A fundamental cause, though, of Hitler's nationalism was the reason why a unified Europe basically was not going to work. He basically is interested only in one thing, the supremacy of the German people and the exploitation of Europe throughout in its allies or its enemies so that the German army and the German war machine could continue to function. For Hitler, this was the essence of his colonial policy. Europe existed fundamentally to serve his interests, just as Japan, with its greater co-prosperity sphere, to throw out colonialists and help the Filipino brothers, the Chinese brothers, the Indonesian brothers. That was nothing but a subterfuge. It was, they treated them as badly as the Germans treated most of the peoples of Europe. Hitler's war plan. Well, before the invasion of the Soviet Union, Hitler looked beyond for his enemy's demise. After the conquest of the East, he thought that he would, by the fall of uh, 1941, have conquered Russia. There would be very few troops after left here. He would be able to concentrate everything against Britain and that Europe basically then either uh, Britain would come uh, to a compromise solution or that he would destroy Britain. So uh, he thought that they would take, uh, easily take Gibraltar and Egypt because there would be very little opposition left because Britain would be left alone. Now let's take a look at his allies and how it, he tried to exploit them. Franco was a very clever man. He used Hitler and Mussolini to prop up his fascist government, to create it, really, and defeat the monarchy of Spain. German troops, planes, tanks, Italian troops, planes, tanks, fought with his fascists in Spain, and they won the Civil War. Afterwards, he began to equivocate, though, in terms of now, after France had been conquered, would Franco join the alliance with Hitler? He said to Hitler that he would join in. In fact, he offered in June of 1940 to go to war with Britain, but he wanted Gibraltar, French Morocco, and several other pieces of African territory. Hitler met with Franco. Uh, this was in the fall, October 23rd. Then he said that he would also, he wanted that territory, and he also wanted the defeat of Britain, and then he would join the Axis Alliance. Well, I want you to think about this. Franco was the last of the principal leaders of World War II to die in the 70s. He remained neutral throughout the entire war. Now, he favored the Germans, but he still remained neutral. So he pursued a policy of non-alignment after exploiting Hitler. <clears throat> 
In fact, this annoyed Hitler so greatly, he told Mussolini that he would rather have his teeth removed than meet with Franco again. <laughs> now let's turn to Italy. Well, of course, remember, fascism was invented by Mussolini in Italy, not by Adolf Hitler. And, in fact, Mussolini shepherded and helped Hitler for many years. I'll think of the Salat of Munich. It was Mussolini who helped to orchestrate the Munich deal. He chaired the meeting to get the great powers to come and to sign that meaningless alliance that wiped out Czechoslovakia. Unfortunately, at the beginning of the war, Mussolini remained neutral. Then, though, he wanted to join in the spoils, so he attacked France. His troops were stopped almost at the border. They got very little out of it. The truth is that Italy was bankrupt before the war even started. And during most of the war, Hitler had to prop up Mussolini by selling him and providing him with armaments, munitions, etc. So Mussolini would have been much better served if he had remained neutral, like Franco, and not have fought in the Second World War. But his own megalomania, like Hitler, sucked him into this war and in the end destroyed him and many, of, many Italians with him. Now let's take a look at other occupations and collaborators. Well, Germany had many allies across Europe. Many of them wanted land, such as Finland up here. In 1940, Stalin attacked Finland to take a piece of land near Leningrad. And Finland allied itself with Hitler to get that land back. And the Finns fought with the German army until 1944. Then they signed a separate peace. The same thing is true with Hungary, Bulgaria, Croatia, the Slovaks, the Romanians. They all became Hitler's allies. And they all suffered from it, particularly from the, with the Russian army, when the Russian army came into Eastern Europe later. Many of them, particularly the Hungarians and Bulgarians, also had brutal occupations of Russia and other parts of Eastern Europe. And now let's turn to Norway, the ultimate collaborator, the Benedict Arnold of Europe, victim Quisling. Norway was heavily occupied during World War II. This was an earlier conquest. And the reason it was occupied, let's go back, is because Hitler needed the iron ore of Sweden. And by occupying Norway and Denmark, he prevented the Allies from interfering with the shipping coming into Germany with those vital supplies. So Quisling, and here's a picture of him with Hitler, uh, there were, by the end of the war, over several hundred thousand German soldiers still in Norway. All right. So Norway was still heavily occupied before the war ended. The Norwegians sent troops that fought in the SS during World War II. They weren't the only ones. In fact, Himmler and the Waffen-SS started out as an elite bodyguard for Hitler. Hitler had a bodyguard of 4,000 men. All right. One of the reasons I intend to do a program here at the museum about all the attempted assassinations of Adolf Hitler. But very few people understand that he had a contingent of 4,000 SS troops. They were the ones defending the bunker, by the way, at the end of the war. They were the last troops left. <laughs> the rest were all blown away. All right. So Himmler abandoned the principle that only Germans could fight for the Reich as they needed more manpower. And 125,000 Western Europeans ultimately served in the Waffen-SS. This included 50,000 Dutch, 40,000 Belgians, both Walloons and Flemings, the Spanish Blue Division. These were fascists that had fought with the Italians and Germans in the Civil War. There were uh, Latvians. There were Lithuanians. There were Ukrainians. There were Russians, and here's a picture with the ultimate group, Muslims. Believe it or not, here was the Germans, the ultimate racists, and they had the revelation that Muslims actually were Aryans. And here's a picture of Adolf Hitler, the, the Mufti of Jerusalem, because they actually recruited 
thousands of Muslims to fight in the German army in the Waffen SS. However, there is the idea that there's only SS, wrong. The German army actually recruited even more troops. It's very simple. You are a Russian captive. They captured three million Russians. Most of them died from starvation. You had a choice. You joined the German army or you starved to death. Many fought in the German army. So the, the, uh, even the Wehrmacht had large numbers of prisoners of war that fought in the German army for, uh, you know, against their countries. Then, of course, there's the uh, guest worker program. And the reason for it is very simple. The Germans needed manpower. Now, at the beginning, what they did was they came up with the idea that they could willingly recruit individuals. And here's a sign in France asking French to volunteer and go to Germany. Remember, 1939-1940, before World War II in the United States, there was widespread unemployment. The Second World War helped to end the Great Depression in the United States, and in many ways it acted as the same way in terms of all the people out of work who were looking for jobs. Also, too, the European firms I mentioned earlier were very happy to be subcontractors to German industry. And they willingly collaborated, every country in Europe, with the German government. In fact, there was one central German contract office that kept an eye on 20,000 European firms, and they stressed in general that there was no offer, resistance offered to the acceptance of German contracts. In fact, the system worked well throughout most of the war. It broke down as the war went on, but in the main, it worked. So what was needed by Germany was more labor to ramp up production. And at first it was voluntary, as this poster shows, and then the Germans began to recruit. Now, the Germans never, the Germans did not recruit women into factories and into their military until the very end of the war. There were a few in the Wehrmacht, but Rosie the Riveter was a rare sight until later in the war in Germany. Not true, though, in recruiting foreign women to work in German factories. Here's a truckload of them coming to work. And here's a barracks of women workers as well. Now remember, at the same time, we have Charles de Gaulle, the head of the Free French, and the beginning of the resistance movement. What would occur, of course, to collaborators across Europe, Norway in particular, Quisling in the end would be hung by the Norwegians, but many of them would be punished. Here's a group of French women who openly collaborated with the Germans. They were lucky, they weren't shot. There were many that were shot, and others who were shot and others that were not. So, collaboration was widespread across Europe. Well, what about resistance? In Nazi Europe, opposition and hatred was directed first at the collaborators before the Germans. These were seen as traitors. Collaborators were prime targets for assassination. For them, on the other hand, the resistance, they were terrorists, they were communists, they were criminals. They were trying to disrupt public order and fragment the nation, like Vichy France. As weapons became more plentiful, the war went on with all its uncertainties, the violence intensified. And in some countries like Greece, it became a civil war. We'll go into that in a little bit. At the outset, resistance had a very vital geopolitical dimension. It had to have foreign backing. Churchill and the British were the first to talk about setting Europe aflame, the Special Operations Executive. They would provide the training, the bombs, the guns for the resistance movements across Europe. Ultimately, the Free French and the OSS in the United States would all run resistance movements. It's interesting, too, because they ran three separate resistance movements. All right? they were not a, this was not a collaborated, allied effort. These were all separated. At the beginning of the occupation in Europe, in Western Europe, the Wehrmacht was less hard against a backdrop of widespread unemployment and dissatisfaction, as I said. 
In fact, for many socialists, they were happy to see democracy overthrown. And they wanted to see it collapse. However, the Germans proved incapable of exploiting this powerful desire. From the beginning, even if German troops behaved correctly, they immediately started issuing threats, prohibitions. They issued, they were, you could not have unauthorized public demonstrations, curfews, you couldn't listen to the British radio, etc. So as this in, uh, increased, Europeans obviously became less and less enamored, and also, too, they saw what? The war was not coming to an end. And uh, the other issue, which we'll talk about briefly later, food became scarcer and scarcer across Europe. There was severe starvation in many parts of Europe. So despite Patan's promises, what occurred was the people realized the war was not going to end anytime soon. And as a result, you started to have the beginning of resistance. By the autumn of 1943, there were 15 to 20,000 people enrolled in the French resistance movement. They were tightly organized, and they certainly were promoted and assisted first by the British, then by the Free French and the United States. In Western Europe, the Allies became the exponent of the secret approach to resistance, such as in Norway, Yugoslavia, uh, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, France. Why? Because they were afraid of provoking these gigantic civilian casualties that I talked about before, where the Germans would merely indiscriminately kill huge numbers of people. Things were much the same even in Britain, even in the Channel Islands. The local authorities discouraged people from open resistance against the Germans. Now, there were exceptions to this, such as in September of 1943, when the Germans ordered the arrest of the Danish Jews and the police started rounding them up, they only found 477 Jews in all of Denmark. Why? Because the other 6,000 had been smuggled by the Danes to Sweden. This was a resistance where the entire population rose up and resisted, and the Germans could not shoot the entire population of Denmark. But this was remarkably an exception. In Norway, there was badly mishandled political transition. Quisling created a huge uproar. There was widespread protest and civil disobedience. And at the same time, there was tremendous draconian results of many Norwegians being shot outright. So they organized a clandestine army in 1940, much as the Poles would, and the idea was lie go and go slow. That was the model, not open resistance. There was even resistance in Finland. Maybe some of you saw the article in the Desert Sun or in the New York Times about Jackie. How many of you heard about Jackie the dog? Any of you see it? Well, this dog in Finland, its master trained it that when he said Hitler, it went high. The Gestapo found out about this and investigated it. It went all the way up to Hitler. They just dropped it. So even in Finland, which was one of the German allies, there was some resistance. Now, in Eastern Europe, the resistance was far more intense. When the Germans overran Poland in 1939, they became a very, they began a systematic policy of destroying Slavic culture. This was very simple. You rounded up all the officers and you shot them. You shot the priests, you shot the professors, you shot all the intellectuals. Poland was a garbage dump to be used and exploited by the German people. That was it. And this is how, this was Hitler's and the Nazi regime's concept of all of Eastern Europe. It was to be cleansed. And German settlers resettled in Poland, the Ukraine, etc., because of German Lieberstrom. The Germans needed this area to expand. Now, some people would say, well, that's no similar to what we did with the American Indian, right? We needed our Lieberstrom, the manifest destiny of the United States. There's a slight difference. We didn't put the Indians in concentration camps, grind them down, and then burn them. 
You could say the reservation system was highly destructive. There was a native population over a period of how many years? Let's see. 1492 to the close of the frontier of 1890. It did take a long time. But to compare that, in my opinion, to this, which was a systematic, highly orchestrated, and controlled by the central government. It was the policy of the government to destroy the Slavs. They'd use them as slave labor or in the army for their own ends. Otherwise, they were nothing. They were lice. They would be destroyed off the face of the earth, period. So the Poles realized this, and they organized a clandestine army and a clandestine government. In the invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941, these new codes were put in from the very beginning. Villages were burned, people were slaughtered. Many of the people of Eastern Europe and Ukraine and others were happy to be liberated from the Russians. They wanted to be allied. In fact, one of the largest armies that fought with the Germans were Ukrainians. They were the last German army to surrender and we turned them over back to the Russians. They all died. So Hitler blew it. There were many people in Eastern Europe who wanted to be liberated from Soviet enslavement, but he was so blinded by his crazy racial policies it did not work. The Germans captured 3.9 million people in the, in the Russian army. They put 400,000 to work. However, most of those German soldiers, those POWs, about 58% died. They never saw home again. As the war went on, while in Eastern Europe, resistance was crushed into silence. In, I'm sorry, in Western Europe, in the East, resistance increased. Because now we were talking about a partisan movement. So supply lines behind the German army were blown up. And Stalin armed partisans, hundreds of thousands of partisans. What will interest this audience is that there were 20 to 30 Jewish partisans fighting with the Russians in the East, actively opposing the Nazis. Now, that's not to say that every Jew in the East became a partisan and took up arms. That's not true. But it is interesting to note that this did occur and that this caused a major disruption uh, with the Soviets. By the end of the war, there were roughly 11,000 partisans in Bosnia, 40,000 in Yugoslavia. 20 German divisions were tied down by Tito's partisans in Yugoslavia by 1944. So this is a whole different kind. This is partisan warfare rather than just resistance. In Poland, by the end of the war, Stalin betrayed the Polish underground in favor of his Polish puppet regime that he was going to have of communists. And he led the underground to disaster by having them begin the Polish uprising as the Russian army was approaching. And then he stopped the Russian army and allowed the SS and Germans to annihilate 40,000 Poles died in Warsaw. The city was leveled to the ground by Hitler. Throughout Eastern Europe, counterinsurgency forces of the Wehrmacht used huge numbers of troops trying to put down these uprisings or these partisans. By this point, though, none of the German army's previous ethical boundaries functioned. Priests were shot and murdered. Women, babies were killed. Jews, Slav, anyone in opposition. But there was no difference between the German army and the SS. All participated in these massacres. Another big issue was food. Probably the number one reason why most people started joining the resistance in Western Europe was very simple. They were starving to death. Hitler cut the ration and cut the ration and cut the ration in order to feed the German army and feed the German people because the blockade was very effective. The Allied blockade, the foodstuffs weren't there. So many people starved, particularly people in major cities. Holland in particular, by the end of the war in 1944, had no food at all. The Germans cut them off. 
because half the country was occupied by the Allies, the other half was occupied by the Germans. <clears throat> In 1944, on the eve of the Normandy invasion, the French sabotage attacks increased sharply. Many of the rail lines were disrupted. But the real uprising came not then, but later, in August of 1944 in Paris. Now, the Allies were going to bypass Paris because it was not an important military objective. There weren't that many German troops left. And the Germans, even though Hitler had ordered it destroyed, the German General Clausewitz surrendered to a French officer, Le Kirk, and the French were allowed to bring in one of their divisions to accept the surrender of France, uh, I mean of Paris. Only 1,500 French lost their lives for the week of the Paris uprising. Think about that in comparison to Warsaw with 40,000. And Paris was not destroyed. De Gaulle arrived the day of the surrender as uh, the president of the provisional government of France. He was hailed by the crowds at the city hall. And with these words, he became famous. Paris, outraged Paris, broken Paris, murdered, martyred Paris, but liberated Paris liberated by itself, liberated by its people, with the help of the French armies, with the support and the help of the whole of France, of the fighting France, of the only France, of the real France, of the eternal France. Well, thanks to this rhetoric, the liberation of Paris started the origins that all of France had risen in resistance to the Germans. But obviously, this was not the case. Luckily, we allowed them to come in. De Gaulle had, of course, objected that we were not going to liberate Paris. We allowed him to liberate Paris, and for the sake of France, for the French to liberate themselves. But now you have a much more balanced idea of what went on in France. So how valuable was this guerrilla warfare? Well, historians are divided. Uh, for many in the, in the West, uh, Albert Speer was asked what French resistance, he replied. The Germans were no more complimentary about other countries, like the Belgians. Now, in the East, there was active resistance by huge numbers of partisans. Hundreds of thousands of Europeans did participate in active opposition all across France, and they paid a heavy price. 30,000 were shot in France. 20,000 free French were killed. 60,000 others in France were deported. Tens of thousands died in Italy, in Greece, and in Norway. These anti-partisan wars, hundreds of thousands from occupied territory. Then civil wars broke out across Europe, in Greece, in Denmark, and in Belgium, in Italy after the Duchess uh, El Duce, Mussolini, fell. There was a civil war. So two major facts arise from the study of European resistance. The first, most people joined the resistance in the war's closing stages. Second, it was this phase that the Germans, the SS, and the Wehrmacht perpetuated most of the huge massacres that we know about because certain areas were designated battle zones. And, of course, the noose was tightening around these Germans, and they fought back and murdered many people. Now let's look at the third dimension, theft. The real profiteers of this war are ourselves, and out of it we shall come bursting with fat. We will give back nothing. We will take everything we can make use of. And if the others protest, I don't give a damn. Adolf Hitler. The Nazis for six years stole everything across Europe, from art, art works to church bell, food, wine, gold, and finally people. Even before the war began, the Nazis seized Jewish property and assets in Austria and Czechoslovakia in order to finance their rearmament efforts. During the war, these stolen assets kept the Nazi economy going. <coughs> This is a great book. I highly recommend it to you. Maybe some of you saw the PBS special on the rape of Europa. 
It was rather boring, I thought, and very repetitious. The book is riveting. It talks and documents what we're going to talk about now very briefly. Before the, when the war started in September of 1939, this is the Louvre. They emptied the Louvre. They emptied the National Gallery. They emptied all the great art galleries of Europe, of free Europe, because they were afraid of bombing and of theft if they lost. And they tried to hide all these paintings. Incredibly, it was the Wehrmacht High Command that initiated a uh, commission to protect the artistic property of the countries they occupied in light of the Hague Convention and they appointed a military officer with a curatorial background in order to safeguard all this art. When the Germans moved into France, they deployed troops and surrounded the museums, the chateaus, etc., to stop pillaging. And the pillaging had started already. In Bordeaux, the French army came in, they went to the chateaus, uh, the famous chateaus, uh, maybe if you drink some of the more expensive wine, uh, Mouton Rothschild, etc., and they started seizing cases and cases of the good stuff. This was stopped by the Wehrmacht. However, Adolf Hitler made it quite clear what was what. He issued an order that same time when the Germans issued the German, the Wehrmacht issued their orders, and this was that the objects were going to be quote unquote protected, saved by the German army or by the ERR, which was the Nazi Art Confiscation Organization. So the Fuhrer set this huge subterfuge up, and immediately the German army and the Nazi party started fighting over who was going to control this. The German army had a big loophole. They, they said, OK, you can seize it. The Nazis can seize it. Goring for his art treasures, Hitler for his, as you'll see in a moment. But guess what? You can't move it. It's going to stay in France. They turn first, this is the Louvre. How many of you have visited the Louvre? Right? They turned it into a huge repository of art. All these stolen collections of the Rothschilds, not just uh, Jewish people from France, but all over Europe had to be centralized, cataloged, and controlled by the Wehrmacht at this, at the Louvre. In fact, they ended up with so much art, they went to the Jeux de Pan. This was uh, previously uh, where the uh, Impressionists were before the Musée d'Orsay was converted in Paris. So many, you maybe have been there. Some of you have been to the Jeux de Pan or the Musée d'Orsay. This, in fact, was built for the beautiful Monet water lily paintings. Maybe you, you have seen them. They're huge, circular paintings. That's what this building was built for, because Monet was going to sell them to the Art Institute of Chicago. Oh my god, this is the 1890s. The national treasures of France are going to Chicago. Have you ever, any of you gone to the Art Institute of Chicago? Any of you? And we have a tremendous collection of French Impressionist art, because they sold it to us. Because the French Academy thought it was dreadful art in the 1890s. Oh yes, they hated it. All right, so, so much material, so there were, these museums were jammed. Now, you should know this. Hey, there is the great emperor himself, Napoleon. Until 1940, the number one thief of Europe was Napoleon. How many of you have been to um, in Italy have been to Venice? You've seen the four horses. The, the Venetians stole them from Constantinople. Napoleon took them and put them in Paris. All right, they got them back, obviously. And he made them sign treaties when they lost it that he had the right to steal the art. He, he, he was very clever about this, all right? So Napoleon was a great art thief, but Hitler surpassed him, as you'll see now. So, so persistent was the German army and the Vichy government in complaining about the theft of all this art that finally they came up with this, the most perverted piece of convoluted legalese in the world. The armistice that the French people had signed, Hitler said, 
was not made with the Jews. It was made only with the French people. So the Jews were not protected. As for the Hague Convention, the Jews and his assets were outside the law since for a century the Jews themselves had considered non-Jews as outside the law. Now here's the kicker. In the end, only the Fuhrer will make the final decision on the disposition of these safeguarded art treasures and where they will be. All right. So, the confiscation continued to pour in. New established museums, as you will see, that the Nazis had in various locations, continued to confiscate this art. However, you should know artists like Picasso, they came back to Paris. They, they openly collaborated with the Germans. They had them to their studios. It's very interesting, too, because the Germans before the war started out by selling what they thought was perverted art, which was his art. <laughs> All right, and they sold, they sold it off at huge prices before the war. They had a big exhibition in Munich of perverted art. And then they had Aryan art in another museum. The lines were out the door for the perverted art. Everyone, all the Germans wanted to see that. Hardly anyone wanted to see what Hitler thought was good art. All right, finally they shut the, the whole thing down. And the Germans were very nice. They would buy all this art. Of course, what they do is they would print occupation marks, lots of them. Germany became a huge debtor nation. They'd buy everything using these inflated marks. Isn't it very nice and legal? The whole thing, of course, was a farce. Now, Adolf Hitler and his number two men, Hermann Goering, were the chief Nazi art collectors. What they couldn't confiscate, they would buy, etc. as I said, using this crazy funny money. Now, we must not forget that Adolf Hitler originally wanted to be what? An artist, that's right. Just think, if the Art Academy in Vienna had admitted him, we might have been spared this. All right, but Hitler had, uh, as a result, he started seizing Jewish assets, this degenerate art, and then he began gathering his own collection, first in Holland, and then in France, and throughout Europe. Then he went and visited, before the war, he visited Mussolini in Rome, and he thought that they needed a bigger museum, more art. So Hitler was buying and amassing art from all over Europe. Now, the National Gallery in Washington, how many of you have been to the National Gallery in Washington, D.C.? It has a collection of 3,000 beautiful paintings that has taken uh, the National Gallery opened in the 1940s, so it's taken it about 60, 70 years to collect those 3,000. Hitler, between 1940 and 1945, collected 8,000 paintings. Now, in April of 1941, he premiered his museum. Here's a picture of him looking at his museum in Linz. Linz is the town he was born in. They, they published a beautiful art magazine. They had illustrations of his collection. Oh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Bregel, Rembrandt, uh, you know, a few of these minor artists. Uh, this is a picture of Hitler looking at the museum uh, in his bunker in Berlin in April of 1945. The Russians are a few blocks away. Uh, the war is going to come. He's going to shoot himself in a few days. Uh, he's looking at his model. But Hitler had even bigger plans. Uh, first of all, Berlin was too small. As he said to Speer, London will be a rubble heap when I finish it. He contemplated building Germany into Germania. This is his triumphal arch. These are the people, get this to work here. The people are here on the bottom, all right? That's the triumphal. You think of the Arch of Triumph in Paris? This is 10 times larger than the Arch of Triumph in Paris. And of course, broad boulevards, that is the new Reichstag. Uh, the Reichstag would have the largest dome in the world. St. Peter's Dome uh, is slightly smaller than the Pantheon in Italy, in, in Rome. You've been to the Pantheon, the largest unsupported dome in the world. You've seen St. Peter's. This is five times the size of St. Peter's Dome. All right? <laughs> you can see the monumental force of Berlin. Of course, after Hitler, there was the Goring Collection. 
Now, Goring was never unpleasant in his dealings. He would arrive on his palatial private train, complete with an oversized bathtub, in elegantly designed uniforms and assistants. He would go from art gallery to art gallery buying, confiscated, or just by outright buying this material. On state occasions, he restrained himself. He liked to design his own uniforms. Uh, though the German people said he wore so many medals that they said the decorations at the edge read continued on the back. <laughs> Now, Goring arrived at the Jeu de Palme in uh, November 1940, was done up uh, for a major offering. The selection was absolutely staggering. He ended up buying from the Rothschilds collection. He bought clocks, statues, jewelry, paintings, etc. Uh, he had Vermeers, Raphaels, Rembrandts, Rubens, Titians, Goyas, uh, etc. But uh, one of the interesting things, of course, is Nazi greed sometimes would come up short. There was a Dutch art forger, Hans van Mergen. He successfully sold Goring this painting, uh, which was supposedly a Vermeer. It isn't. It's a forgery. Mm -hmm. it, it never existed. Uh, after the war, the uh, forger was tried by the Dutch for collaborating with the Germans, and it was brought out he was acquitted for having made a fool out of Hermann Goring in the Third Reich. Later, this painting, though, sold for $23,000 at Sotheby's. So now, where did all this end up? Well, Goring styled himself as a sportsman, so he built a small hunting lodge. Uh, that sort of became this, uh, Karen Hall. This is where he housed all of his artwork. Um, he had eight homes. This was his favorite. And there, there are the protected art he's hanging onto. Uh, it had uh, it sat two hours from Berlin. It was packed with bison, elk, and pet lions. This is a picture of Goring's second wife and uh, Mussolini early in the war with one of his lions. Upstairs, for those of you that like the train at the Living Desert, uh, any of you like the train at the Living Desert? I do. Upstairs, he had a big model railroad with hundreds of feet of track toy airplanes with wires rigged to drop bombs. Now, as the Russians approached Karen Hall in 1945, he blew up the whole thing. He had moved the art out. Don't worry, he did move the art out. So between 1941 and July of 44, 4,174 cases that filled 138 boxcars contained 22,000 pieces of art were shipped back to the Reich. Uh, Hitler, they ran out of room. They didn't know where to put it. Well, he came up with this little rock pile, which, of course, is the pseudo-castle of the mad uh, Ludwig of Bavaria, and he filled it. But it was so vast, they had storehouse after storehouse crammed in Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, with loot. Uh, by August of 1944, when it's, all this stopped, the Allies were almost at the French border, the Germans had raided 71,619 homes. They had shipped off over a million cubic feet of goods and, 20, and almost 30,000 railroad cars. This, by the way, is the uh, gold bars of the National Bank of the Netherlands that you're looking at. So by the end of the war, the US and its allies appointed a monument commission of art experts to try to track down and help return all this Nazi loot. And this was a major, major problem. They found, as you can see, things stocked in churches all over the place, in 109 depositories across. One of the most interesting cases, when Patton discovered the gold supply of Germany in this uh, mine, and here's a picture of Eisenhower, Bradley, and Patton looking at the Vermeers and other art treasures in this salt mine near the German-Austrian uh, border. Uh, uh, and Goring had a train, and the train was loaded with art. They intercepted it near the eagle's nest. And as you see, there's just a sheer mag. They found hundreds of paintings, the manuscript of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. That they found the artifacts, uh, the. Uh, relics of Charlemagne, the robes of the Virgin, the gold vessels of different cathedrals, 
And here is the corker of them all. Uh, here are uh, 5,000 church bells looted from all over Europe, and they had to figure out where they belonged. They, they looted them for the, the metal involved. I mean, we're talking about just uncontrolled looting that was highly organized by a central government on the greatest scale. And then let's talk about the guest worker program that became the slave labor program. The defeat of France, all of these soldiers, a million unemployed in France, many of them went first as guest workers. However, what occurred by 1942, 1943, Hitler issued directives for the security of prisoners, slave labor, forces, and booty. Why? He put Albert Speer in control of the production of the war economy. The Germans had a very inefficient war production economy. In 1942, they had an army of 9.4 million. In 1943, they had ramped it up to 11.2. How did they do that? They got more workers. They had a workforce of 35.5 million. They ramped it up to 37 million. How did they do it? Slave labor. They imported it from all over Europe. They increased tank production in 1942 from 350 a month in 1943 to 700 tanks a month. So they ramped up. That's how they kept the war going. Speer probably did more to help Hitler in this endeavor than anyone else. And he helped to orchestrate the slave labor, the theft of all these individuals. In fact, in France, many young men and uh, women fled into the countryside in order to escape being sent to Germany, and they helped to form the nucleus of the Marquis of the resistance movement. Eventually, tens of thousands of civilians were herded into 105 labor and concentration camps to work all across Germany. Jews, everyone. There were 2.8 million new workers assigned in 1943. By the end of the war, there were 5 to 7 million slave labor workers in Germany. 